Right. Where's his check? <laughs> Your check is in the how important we feel this this whole thing is. And I just thought I would mention that the other day, President of Panama was here. And uh, again, he is totally behind the idea that we have proposed that with the Contadora, that they want to emphasize the necessity of their Sandinista government actually negotiating with their own people, those we call the Contras, uh, in there to try and and the goal is to get back to what were the original revolutionary goals. And we feel that this is vital. These letters are reiterating some things that we said to the, to the Senate, but uh, maybe that you would like to have also to refute some of the uh, accusations that have been made and what is, what is in our mind. But the, it's just, there's no question in our minds anymore, and I think all the evidence is incontrovertible, that we have a totalitarian communist state as far as that government is concerned. The people of Nicaragua have not bought that. There's increasing unhappiness, increasing desertions from their military going over to the countries, and we just feel there's no way that we cannot go forward with this help to them, which, as you've been told, is non-lethal, and we think that this particular amendment would be gutted by some of the others that have been proposed and that this amendment will keep the democratic forces there with some hope that they can get a pluralistic government, a democratic form of government there. So I think it's about time that we, that you already we opened it to discussion. So they're, they're anxious to ask you questions. Let's go. This present day, we're pretty I would like to take this opportunity, first of all, to, to thank you, uh, Mr. McFarland, for the, the close support in working on this amendment. There are some individuals here, Mr. President, that have been very supportive in this process that opposed the original Michael Amendment, but believe wholeheartedly that the stand that you've taken in support of this amendment and the positions that you've restated in your letter will go a long way to make this truly a, a bipartisan uh, amendment and a policy as to Nicaragua. And if I could, Mr. President, I just wanted to, to point to a couple of people here that were very involved. And Mr. Richardson, who was chairman of the Hispanic Caucus from New Mexico, was one that uh, had raised a number of concerns that uh, I think have been addressed. And, and again, I appreciate that, that effort. I know uh, Mr. Slattery, and Mr. Uh, Barton, Mr. Stallings, Mr. Watkins, and Mr. Andrews, uh, all of Mr. Bustamante, uh, Mr. Robinson, who I think left. Larry's over the corner, as usual. But uh, they, they have uh, uh, raised a number of concerns with the original policy that I think that we've been able to, to address. And again, I believe that your statements in this letter, again, the, the reaffirmation of the support for the Democratic Center, the, the truly small D Democrats in Central America who want a policy of reconciliation within Nicaragua is, is going to, to make this policy sellable to the American public. And I think in the past it hasn't been, but I think the statements you make today clearly put us on the high ground uh, as to Central America and Nicaragua, and I appreciate your support. All right. Let me just tell you one little incident, and I'll take whatever comes up. And thank you very much. Um, a couple of years ago, at least, when the military aid was really pouring in there from the Soviet bloc and the tanks and, and all of that, there was a ship, and we, we really had to take, you know, some of them were coming through the canal to unload on the Pacific side, and they go through the canal. We got a bill of lading. <laughs> we know what's on that ship. So there was one that had those military helicopters, which they're using, and they denied. We made it public that this was what was coming, the ship from the Soviet Union with helicopters. Oh, they denied it vociferously, publicly said this was all, there was farm equipment that was coming in. <coughs> We were a little worried because we knew what was there. Mm -hmm. 
you know, have they dumped something overboard uh, for how to get the propaganda message, or have they uh, ducked in some place and uh, unloaded this stuff? And, and particularly when they then announced publicly that they would have the international press on the docks to watch that ship unload. And we thought, they've done something. So the ship was there, and the ship unloaded, and the international press on the dock consisted totally of the Cuban press. <laughs> <laughs> that was the international <laughs> press. <laughs> so then we, we knew we were able, as you know, to find out. We didn't know they'd unloaded the helicopters, and they've since been in action. Mr. Bonnie, uh, I think raised the key issue here, Mr. Secretary, you responded to it partially. If, if those countries surrounding Nicaragua knew that they had the support of the United States Congress, because they know they had administration support, if they knew they had the support of the United States Congress, would the attitude be different? The attitude of those countries would be different in the context of the question raised by Mr. Bonnie. Would they be more willing to come forward and say, yes, we need, we need your support? Oh, I believe entirely, yes. I think this is one of the things. They've been, and with the way we've gone back and forth, they're unsure, they're scared to death of Nicaragua. They know that's the threat to them. And they're hesitant about how far they can go without finding themselves the next mix. And they've made, well, when the President of Honduras was here just recently, that was very much a part of our discussion there. And I assured him, as far as we were concerned, the fish lady was, no, we could be counted on them. But uh, they, they know also enough about our government to know that there are limitations on it, and the president could do it. Mr. President, Jim Snyder, you can. So I have some real concerns about how you logistically plan to deliver this, this humanitarian assistance to the countries. Can you give us uh, assurances that that we're not going to get involved in using military aircraft, U.S. military aircraft, to deliver this humanitarian assistance within Nicaragua. What are your plans to actually logistically deliver the aid to the countries? Well, I think most of this aid will be delivered, at least roughly our thinking now is, on the Honduras side of the border. But uh, no, we have no plans for military aircraft to do it. People in there. And say absolutely flat that be no U.S. military aircraft delivering supplies inside Nicaragua. That's absolutely not and can we, anybody's plan or idea. Mr. Secretary, can we construe from that also that there will not be any uh, U.S. aircraft, period, that are owned by the United States government delivering this assistance inside the, the border of Nicaragua? Absolutely. Yes. What are, are what you would consider the minimum result or gains that you would have to see from this effort before you would not ask for military aid in the future? Well, some progress that they legitimately were uh, discussing in a peaceful way. In other words, remember March 1st, it was the Congress who offered to lay down their arms and enter into peaceful negotiations. Now, they're one-time partners of the revolution and thought they were fighting for a democratic revolution. And it was the Sandinista government that refused to negotiate with them. And the, the Contadora, as I was assured in the day yesterday by the president of Panama, the, the Contadora group, they want this, these negotiations to open up. And our suggestion then, and our plan was that involve the church as kind of the mediator that everyone ought to be able to trust in the overseeing that this is a fair effort at negotiations. And we feel once they get into that, then uh, it's going to be very easy to determine whether there is a, a legitimate effort being made to resolve this, and if not, uh, who is responsible for, for not making it legitimate. So the negotiations began and you would not ask for military aid in the future? No, what we said was in the original plan, peace plan, we did want to stick. And incidentally, uh, the president of Panama used that term. He believes in the carrot, and this is, he thinks this is the carrot that we're holding out. But he says, 
to make carrot work, you've got to have a stick nap over here someplace that says, um, you know, if, if nothing happens and if they just stay with their present position and maybe just go through the motions of negotiation and nothing happens and it still ends up uh, another Cuba communist state, <coughs> that uh, there should be some, some threat. Well, our <coughs> idea of the threat was that we would resume military aid to the Contras. Because the Contras will be in the position of having laid down their arms and, uh, and a total ceasefire. Oral and Georgia, do you have a feeling about how South American countries feel about our support? Yes, I do, because I early on made a trip down there, several of them. And this is one of the reasons why I squirm every time I hear these accusations that I've got an idea in the back of my mind of uh, military action there. Virtually every head of state in the Latin American countries with the memories and their people's mind. It's political with them. They know that their people have that memory of the big colossus of the North back in the old naughty gunboat days when our gunboat diplomacy. And all of them say one thing. We can't do it without your help. We need your weapons. We need the training that you can give our people. We need the resources that you can provide. We don't want your men. We'll provide the manpower. They don't want Americans again, for whatever reason, coming in there uh, and restoring that old image. And in many of them, it's kind of it's pretty evident that what they're talking about is they would understand if it had to happen as a leader. They could never sell it to their people. So I've said to all of our people from the very first, I mean, I'm, I'm reluctant to get out and shout this around too much because I don't think it hurts if somebody like the San Sandinista government worries about whether we might or not. Uh, I like to see them lose sleep. But the truth of the matter is, there's no way that we could have an ally or friend left in Latin America if we started landing the Marines on the beach. Can we, for about 90 days or 120 days, once we pass this legislation, get some type of report on the leadership of Latin America for their comment to supporters, to some degree, I don't know how, to some degree, and also if we can program some leadership within the Contra area for the church and the unions in the business area can identify some type of leadership to take over the Contra operation against the Sandinistas so that we can have some idea as to who are the leaders within this area, who is the leader that's like the Duarte and Salvador. Well, some of these men are like Robello and Cruz, men who were part of the revolution. And they're basically the leaders now of the, of the countries. One of the things that's difficult to do, unless there's some sign of hope, when you have a totalitarian government as the Sandinistas have, what person there in their country, uh, civilian people, business people, and so forth, how far can they go in standing up and apparently taking the side of the of democracy with the knowledge that the whole thing could fall apart and then they'd have to get out of the country if the Sandinistas were still the government. Duarte did that. Huh? Duarte did that. They yes. just kicked him out of the country. Yeah, that's right. Mr. Okay. President, I'm Mike Andrews from Texas. Uh, one of the <clears throat> One of the arguments uh, against your policy, I think, has been in, in the House that uh, the Contra's goal is to overthrow the government in Nicaragua, while the administration's goal may well be for a negotiated settlement. And I wonder, hypothetically, assuming that the administration gets its way, that the Contra army is built up to 20 to 30,000 fighting men that we continue with a negotiated settlement with the government of Nicaragua and are successful. And you reach the point where you feel that it's time to settle the case with Nicaragua. They have acceded to, to our demands for the most part. Are you confident that the Contras will participate in that settlement? Are we creating a situation? Is there a danger that these Contras by the time we built a 30,000-man fighting army, 
will not be willing to lay down their arms, but simply to pursue their goal of a complete uh, overthrow of the government. No, I think the very fact that they have taken the lead repeatedly, and the last time was March 1st, and now with the acceptance of our proposal based on that, the fact, the fact that they have been the ones that said, we'll lay down our arms, uh, let, us, uh, let us come in and negotiate with you as fellow revolutionaries and what kind of government that we want. Did you want to say something about it? The President's right, and it's useful just recently in the past week or so, the unified Nicaraguan opposition, uh, Cruz and company Calero have said publicly, the only way that power ought to change in Nicaragua is through an elective process. You get the quote for it. Did, did, uh, did you tell them about your experience with the leaders down there and the targets? <coughs> I did, but that's a good thing. Well, here's something we ought to know, because there's quite a disinformation campaign, whether the Contras are savage guerrillas and so forth, but what they are. Bud was down there talking to them, and he said militarily, he said, how come you don't hit any of the strategic targets? You know, you could really cripple the economy and so forth, and uh, there, the Sandinista government, you hit the power plants and the bridge, the same as the communist guerrillas are doing in El Salvador. And the leaders of these countries said, no. They said, that would hurt the people. And we're of the people. So they'll, they'll fight a military opponent, but they won't attack these strategic targets that, like in El Salvador, look what's happened to the economy when the power plants go out and factories have to close down and, and all of this, transportation, the infrastructure. And the leaders of the countries in Nicaragua said, no, sir, because that might hurt the government, but would also be hurting the people. Mr. President, I'm Buddy Romer from Louisiana. I've been uh, loud in my opposition to you when I thought you were wrong, I can think of Lebanon. But I've been equally loud in my praise of you when I think you're right, and I think you're right on this issue. And I've been with you for some time. Two points come to my mind in looking over this group today. First of all, it is a bipartisan effort. Yes. On, the, on the House floor three, four weeks ago, we got 46 Democrats, I think I'm right, to stand up for the Michael Amendment. We got 40 Democrats to go with military assistance, which was our first vote on the House floor. So be reminded, I know you are often, but I'd like to take this chance to remind you that from the beginning, it has been bipartisan, and we ought to make sure it ends that way. Oh, buddy, I thank you. Yes, this is something that has to be said over and over again. We've got a very proud history in this country, and sometimes we tend to forget it in our own partisan rivalries. But the thing that's characterized this nation is it's like the family fight. You can have a family fight, but if your neighbor gets into it, the family comes together. And at the water's edge, there are no parties. We're, we're Americans. Well, uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that in this room, and I'd like you to say it to America every chance you get to. Point number two, and I'll leave you alone for today. Uh, the, the, one of the strongest affirmations of what you're trying to do, in my personal experience, has been a conversation with President Jose Napoleon Duarte of El Salvador when he was in town not too many weeks past. Yeah. He knows the carrot and the stick operation. He knows the effect in his own country of what the, Nic the Nicaraguans are trying to do to him, the Sandinistas, in terms of command and control and training the rebels that he's fighting. And I just believe that he supports you 100% in what you're trying to do. I think it's a strong point. We're going to make it on the House floor this week, but I'd like you to make it every chance you get to. Well, I'd be very happy to. Mr. President, as you know, it's a difficult vote for many of us. And uh, when we confront our church leaders, they continually criticize our efforts on behalf of the conference. Uh, the Secretary reviewed for us some of the negative effects of the last vote. I'm wondering if you could just re-emphasize for us some of the positive effects of what we've been doing in the past and what we <coughs> expect to happen out of our continued support for the conference. Oh, I think, first of all, if you look at, at what these last few years have been happening in Latin America generally, the turn toward democracy. And 90% of the people there now live under democracy or in countries that are moving toward it. And this is our, what we call the Jackson Plan. It came right from it, that bipartisan commission went down there and came back 
are recommending. The greatest help then, if, if it wasn't for this cancer sitting there, Nicaragua, a plan where the United States for the first time could really set up a program of helping them build the infrastructure, the economy that they need to eliminate that society that <coughs> is totally poverty or totally rich and build an economy where their standard of living can come up by their, their own efforts. And this, I heard just the other day from President Hanel, he, he described this to me as if it was an idea that was selling us and it's been our idea all along. We've tried a lot of things in the past, but the trip that I made the first year I was here to, to Central America or to South America too, and to tell all of them, we know there have been efforts in the past, well-intentioned efforts, but it's always been the big colossus of the North coming down and saying to them, here's what we're going to do. And I went down and said, look, we want to hear your ideas. Uh, what do you think we should do? Uh, we're all neighbors. It's the most unique situation in all the history of the world, from the tip of Tierra del Fuego to the North Pole. We all have the same heritage of coming here as pioneers to these two continents with the bridge in between. We all basically worship the same God. Granted, we speak about basically three different languages, Brazil with Portuguese, the others with Spanish, and us with English. But we have so much in common that we ought to be able to make this whole 650 million people in these continents, such neighbors that we can have borders between all of us, like the border between us and Canada and Mexico, where we don't have to have armed guards and so forth. And it's, um, I just have read the other day, and then let me say one thing about a theatrical troupe from Moscow, young people, came here to put on shows, and they started in Canada with some shows in Canada, then were sent down here. And one of them describing the, when they got to the border from like Montreal, came to the United States. They didn't have to stop or show any papers or do anything and there weren't any guards or gates or anything else. They didn't even know when they had left Canada and were now in the United States and they were all awestruck <laughs> by this. Well, this averages and so forth and say, well, 7.2% unemployment average or whatever. The goal by that's a little bit like the fellow that drowned trying to wade across a river whose average depth was two and a half feet. Uh, we know that it isn't the average, that there are pockets in the country that have particular problems. But again, where the overall economy is concerned, is it going to be helped if we remain rich here with all our problems, but rich here, surrounded by these other hundreds of millions of people in this continent, in these continents, in poverty? Or isn't there going to be a better economy for all of us if we are all able to trade with each other and raise our standards of living. Those people down there, their standard of living is raised. Uh, they're not only going to be customers for things in their own country, they're going to be customers for things in ours. Everybody is going to, to benefit. That's the same, I share that the third district of Oklahoma can raise their income and be good for America too. It's yeah. like when raising it. Yeah. So what I'm talking about that is that, they, that the raising the standard there and that that can be helped by a more prosperous world with a higher standard of living worldwide. And that's why this Jackson plan is not one aimed anymore at just doling out. <coughs> you know, I've had a feeling that a lot of our foreign aid, I've been as critical of it as anyone back over the years. I'm out on the mashed potato circuit, I'm, I had a lot of examples I could use. <laughs> I fell over there in, in the, the Asian area. He'd been lieutenant colonel when he became head of the government. He left office with $80 million. Now, you don't save $80 million out of a lieutenant colonel salary. <laughs> but you know, that was for an aid where I remember we, we built song, provided sawmills for a country that didn't have any roads. And uh, I know we built another that had miles of paved roads for a country that didn't have any roads. Yeah. No, but if we could go in and stimulate an economy and create customers by doing that, as well as being customers for the things they provide. Mr. President, I just wanted to
So respond to Ben's question, I think Bud may be able to shed some light on it. One of the vocal opponents of, of this policy has been the churches, and uh, many of us hear constantly from the church groups uh, within our states that <coughs> have been inside Nicaragua that there's atrocities and so forth. I believe by your statement and uh, to our in the letter and, and your, your support of the improvement in human rights by the resistance forces is going to go a long way to respond to the concerns that the church has had. And Bud, can you give it, shed some light as to what the resistance, Democratic resistance is going to be announcing in the next few days as to some of their policies? I know it was leaked in the New York Times that uh, last week that they were going to come out and issue a proclamation like a Declaration of Independence or a Bill of Rights uh, asserting political institutions over men, that, uh, that they are a political body, that they are going to have rule of law as opposed to uh, just armed resistance. Uh, can we have some inkling as, as to what information you have as to whether or not they're going to announce this in the next few days? I think before long you will see the entire community of the unarmed people of Cruz leadership and other civilians bring together the hardy people from the south, the fellow and the FDM people up north and reaffirm what they have said earlier about <coughs> number one, that the government must only change, can only, through a peaceful electoral process. If they condemn human rights violations and will take action to prohibit them in their own ranks and once more ask for the church to foster this dialogue between the government and the opposition. May I just say, and I'll take a question here also on this, I recognize that there are many well-meaning people uh, in our religious groups, but there are also great divisions within. And the well-meaning people are those that want a peaceful settlement of anything, and it's properly so, they don't believe in killing back and forth. But we've got to recognize that probably one of the best and most sophisticated disinformation networks in the world is the network made by the communist bloc that, well, I can tell you just one example of it. It was only a couple of years ago that they uh, planted a story in a paper and professed to show a letter that I'd written to the King of Spain. Well, it was a letter that was very harmful to me and was very harmful to him. I never wrote such a letter. He never got such a letter. And finally, that one was exposed, and they had to admit it was a phony, but they do things like that. Now, one day, there was a story about a bishop, a Catholic bishop, who was leading a couple of hundred refugees out of Nicaragua toward the Honduran border. And they were attacked by the Contras. And he was trying to save these people. Well, then he came back. He's a bishop from Iowa. I called him on the phone. And I told him this story, which had been published, about this. And he said, no. He said, we were attacked by the Sandinista army, the military. He said, the Contras helped save us. But this is the kind of thing that they can just shamelessly plan. And the many, as I say, of our people, they don't understand who the bad guys and the good guys are. Mr. President, the hardest thing for any politician is to admit that one has made a mistake, and I want to tell you, I voted for Barnes Hamilton, I made a mistake. But I want you to understand, I'm going to support the Michael Amendment. I intend to go to the floor and go against my party, because I think you're right. But I want you to know, like Buddy Echo, it's tough on many of us. In Little Rock, Arkansas, I've got my uh, bishop of the Methodist Church, I've got the peaceniks marching on my office, it would be politically expedient for me to vote against you. Because I've got a colleague in Arkansas that echoes the other side every day, and, and I haven't been around here long enough to count some of that. But my point is, I wish that if you win or if you lose, please don't just say, well, the Democrats did it again. There are some Republicans that voted against you, too. And there are some Democrats that are going to help you. But the point I want to make is, all I hear from some of the liberals in Congress is, well, go on over there and flirt with Republicans. They're going to come in and whip your tail the next week. <laughs> and I guess the point I'm trying to make is Buddy, Buddy Norman will come out and say what he thinks. But I think you ought to back off of us good Democrats once in a while.
don't you think I'm a little frustrated? I go out there and make a speech. And then I tune on the TV news that night, and I see a shot about 20 seconds of me approaching the podium, and then I see about 10 seconds of me saying something innocuous, not important at all, while the voice of Sam Donaldson tells the people what he wants to say, I say. And so you don't know how many times I've said this and talked about this thing and the bipartisan approach and so forth. But only the people in the audience know about it. It never gets any place. Well, I'm going to do right, try to do my part, Mr. Michael. If you'll give me some time, I think you'll be proud of my speech. But I just wanted you to know, if, if, if we want something once in a while, can we call over and get something for ourselves? Listen, I know, maybe I shouldn't say this, maybe it happens. Yesterday, uh, I shook the hands of 150 office holders from a number of states, office holders at the local and the state level, up to it, including judges, legislators, and so forth, all of who uh, were Democrats who have become Republicans. The only thing I'm going to add to that is to say that you're absolutely right about some of our Republicans. Uh, I wish to hell we were organized like baseball where we could do some trading. Mr. President, uh, uh, I was down there working this problem with Dave and Bob and Dante and everybody, and you uh, related the story that I think would be useful because there's some doggone much uh, high level rhetoric that we're probably going to hear up on the Hill today about uh, the evil minded tenant of the White House to do various things. Uh, you might hear it tomorrow, maybe even Thursday. And one time when we were down here, you were talking about Ortega and the fact that he stopped in Spain, which used to be his real buddy, at a great meeting with the Prime Minister. And they did something in public. And I, I think it might be helpful for the members here if you told us. Uh, what happened so that as we begin to listen to this avalanche of rhetoric that they came down about how evil the country is, you might relate what the Prime Minister of Spain reacted to when Ortega came back from us. Young man Gonzalez, who is, as you know, is exactly a socialist, although he's, he's moderating and turning more to entrepreneurship and so forth in this country, but he asked me and I told him, as much in detail as I could, what our plan was. <clears throat> a plan for peaceful negotiations, the country's laying down the weapons and so forth, and under the church. And uh, he listened very attentively. Uh, the only comment he made was that his impression had been that, uh, uh, that the Sandinista government was on the way to totalitarianism, <coughs> and that I seem to say that they achieved it, which I think they have. But that was the only comment he made. He didn't dispute or anything. Well, I knew that Ortega was coming to see him on the way back from Moscow. And then I found out that he and Ortega had their meeting. And then they both appeared before the press, press conference. And Ortega stood up, and pretty soon Ortega was teeing off on me and calling me a Nazi, and including the United States also in that. And Gonzalez, in front of the press, just stepped up to the microphone and interrupted Mr. Ortega, and he said, President Reagan is not a Nazi, and the United States saved Europe from Nazism, and if they need to do it again, the United States under President Reagan will save Europe again from Nazism, and uh, I don't know how the hell Ortega got off stage. <laughs> 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 Mr. President, I want to thank you very much. I know you geared up for the time you lost. You're far beyond that. I want to thank you for the letter. And you can ask more. Thank you very much.